pray, and then we will dive into that passage together. Lord, we do thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you so much just for the opportunity we have just to gather together here in this place, Lord, to uh, not only worship you through song and through fellowship, but also to, uh, Lord, just uh, look into your word. And, and Father, I pray that today as we have your word open before us, that you will just uh, empty our hearts from just the distractions that may be weighing on us heavy and Lord, help us just to focus for the next few moments on your word, what you want to teach us, and may we leave here, Lord God, just better equipped to serve you and more just devoted to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as I said, uh, we all hopefully had a good Thanksgiving week, uh, enjoyed uh, good food and time with family and, and different things like that. And whether you had the opportunity to do those things or not, hopefully it was a, a better week than what I had in some respects, all right? Uh, my phone stopped working, and so you don't realize how much you use your phone until it stops working. So that was kind of interesting this week. Uh, one of our cars, I believe, got totaled, uh, a little fender bender, and so the airbag deployed. And so I think that's going to be uh, totaled. And so I uh, have a lot of things to be thankful for, but it was one of those weeks that you just look back on and say, okay, you know, God, you're still good even though this is going on. And then to top it all off, yesterday I'm watching football, my favorite college football team, and their rivalry game. Ohio State against Michigan, and Ohio State loses, all right? So adding insult to energy, injury. No, obviously that was not the biggest thing of the weekend. But as a sports fan, it is one of those things that I follow closely. And I know some of you who know me well know that I am definitely a sports fan. I love the Ohio teams and things like that. But one of my favorite things when I watch sports is to see some of the post-game interviews. And uh, it's always interesting for me to kind of see what players say. And I'm amazed sometimes at the different players that will acknowledge God. You know, I want to thank God for this victory. And, and, and sometimes I, I begin to wonder, I'm like, you know, it's interesting that he says that. But like, I don't know, the spiritual side of me then begins to try to almost become, I don't want to be judgmental, but it's like, you know, I know like some of your life and it's just like sometimes it doesn't add up. Anybody else? do that sometimes when you hear people acknowledge God or whatever. It's just like something doesn't add up. And again, I'm not trying to be judgmental because at the end of the day, only God knows the heart of a person. Would you agree? Only God knows the heart of somebody. In fact, it says that in uh, one of the verses we have here, Proverbs 21 verse 2 says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. And so only God knows the heart of a person. And so sometimes I'll kind of dig into that athlete, see if I can find a testimony. And sometimes I'm amazed at how often some of these athletes actually do have a genuine testimony about when they came to Jesus. And, and you dig a little deeper and you find, wow, it's amazing that even people with this platform would be willing to say it about that. But other times you kind of dig and it's just like, I wonder if they were just saying that to say it. I wonder how much it actually means in their heart. And uh, Matthew 7, verse 15 and 20, gives us some insight into um, what it's going to be like one day. It says, But where are false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves? You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. And so the Bible makes it very clear here that um, it is by our fruits that we should be able to be identified as a follower of Jesus, right? And so it's very clear that the way that we live should be an identifying factor of the fact that we claim to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, and another sad reality is the Bible makes it clear that there's some who will maybe profess God and some who will proclaim to know God that when the final judgment comes, we're actually going to be very surprised. So Matthew 25 says this, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne before him and will be gathered to all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left. So the Bible says that there is coming a day when all of us will stand before Jesus. And there will be some on that day who will stand there and think they are part of the family of God, only to be separated into this category that this passage refers to as the goats, those who are not part of 
God's flock. And when God separates them, they're going to be like, you know, but, but why are we in this crowd? And, and Jesus will begin to explain to them, well, when I was naked and hungry and poor, you never reached out to help me. And so, again, I, I watch some of these athletes and some of these famous people, and, and, and they will kind of talk about thanking God for this victory or whatever. And, and some of them may be genuine, but sometimes I wonder, are they sincere in what they say, or is it just merely words that they are speaking? And you've probably encountered people like that in your own life, people who you know well, and all of a sudden they say some spiritual statements like, huh, it doesn't really measure up to what I've seen in your life. Am I the only one that's seen that sometimes from time to time? And again, I'm not saying we should be judgmental because none of us know the heart of a person. And I'm not going to be there on judgment day when that person stands before them. But I do know this, the Bible makes it clear that our fruits in our life should demonstrate a, a walk and a relationship with Jesus. And so here in the beginning of Acts 19, we have several interesting events that are going to take place as Paul ministers here in Ephesus. And however, as interesting as this narrative is, there's actually a deeper spiritual connection to all that is happening in this passage. You see, with each of these events, I believe that God is clarifying for us what true salvation looks like. And so that's kind of the essence of our message today. In fact, if you're taking notes and want to write down a title, the title is simply this, True Salvation. Because my goal today is to dive into this passage and see what is it that the Bible proclaims to us that is the essence of salvation. Because if there's some that are going to be deceived in the final judgment day, wouldn't you want to know for sure before you get to that point, so that you are not deceived, so that you are not caught off guard when that judgment day comes. And I think in the midst of everything that's happening here in Acts 19, one of the things we see very clearly is some of the elements of what true salvation is all about. And when I say true salvation, I am talking about what a true relationship with God looks like. And so let's dive into this passage and, and see what some of those elements are. And so what I want us to see is there's really three major events that take place in this passage. And with each of these events, it teaches us something about this idea of true salvation. And so the, the, the three elements are this. If you're kind of one of those people like to, like to know ahead of time where we're going, the three events we see take place here are this. We see a meaningful baptism. We see a massive beatdown. And we see a monstrous bonfire. That, that's what the three events that are taking place in this passage. And you might be saying, what in the world are you talking about? Well, I think as we dive in, you'll see what I'm saying. And each of these events are going to teach us something about what true salvation is all about. So the first one is this idea of a meaningful baptism. Let's begin in verse number one. It says, and it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus very found some disciples. So let's stop here for a second. And Jolene already told us a little bit about Ephesus and, and what she saw when she uh, visited that city. But let me tell you a little bit about what it would have been like back in those days. You see, Ephesus in this time was the capital city of the Roman province in Asia. It had a population of around a quarter million people, probably one of the largest cities in that day. It was a significant center of trade as major roads connected Ephesus to all the other significant cities in Asia Minor. It was a city that was known for its amphitheater, which was the largest in the world at that time. It was designed to hold up to 50,000 spectators. Now, we know we have stadiums today in our country that are bigger than that. But even in today's you know, accounting, that is still a, a big stadium, even in today's technology. And so Ephesus was also, according to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, it said this. It was the location of the great temple of Artemis, or Diana, that was built in 550 B.C. It says the temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was 425 feet long and 220 feet wide. Each of its 127 pillars was supported, uh, that supported the roof to its colonnade was 60 feet high. So it was this massive building. That was a spectacle for all to see. It was considered one of the seven ancient wonders or seven wonders of the ancient world. And so everything in the city of Ephesus was centered around this temple to the goddess Diana. And so as Paul is there and comes to this city, 
Uh, we see, and uh, I, I had a map up there. Let me see if I can get back to it real quickly. There it is. All right, you see this map here. Paul started off over there in uh, Antioch, and he traveled up, visited some of the churches he had already started, but then he makes it a point to go to Ephesus, and that is where this passage is taking place, all right? And so we are here in Acts chapter 19. He comes to Ephesus, and why he's there, um, he meets some of these uh, the, these. It says disciples. And so, Brian, if you want to go back to that other slide for me, that way I don't have to click all the way through. And, and so he finds that what it says are some disciples there. And it says in verse 2, and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who has to, was to come after him, and that is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So he, he encountered these people who are disciples of John the Baptist. And we've talked about that already a little bit with this man by the name of Apollos. It was a man who had a somewhat understanding of Scripture, but didn't really understand the essence of Jesus and who he was and, and what he was all about. And so what we need to understand is the book of Acts is a book about transitions. And we've been seeing the transition from Judaism to Christianity a lot in these last couple chapters. We saw Paul was still, you know, holding on to some Judaism as he took that Nazarite vow. We talked about Apollos as he was, you know, this disciple of John the Baptist who was growing and learning more about who Jesus was. And as he was discipled by Priscilla and Aquila, he came to a full understanding of the gospel and who it was that Jesus was. As we see that Paul, as he comes to Ephesus, he meets these disciples who were followers of John the Baptist who understood the Old Testament, who had been baptized into John's baptism, but did not fully understand what Christianity was all about. So these disciples in Ephesus were living within the confines of old information. And it kind of reminds me of the Battle of New Orleans. Anybody ever heard of the Battle of New Orleans? Uh, it was part of the War of 1812. And in all intents and purposes, it was really a pointless battle. All right, let me read to you a little bit about what it said about this battle in history.com. It said, on December 24th, 1814, Great Britain and the United States signed a treaty in Ghent, Belgium, that effectively ended the War of 1812. So that's December 24th, 1814. But news was slowed across the pond, however. And on January 8th, 1850, the two sides met in what is remembered as one of the conflict's biggest and most decisive engagements. In the bloody Battle of New Orleans, future President Andrew Jackson and his motley assortment of militia fighters, frontiersmen, slaves, Indians, and even pirates weathered a frontal assault by a superior British force, inflicting devastating casualties along the way. The victory vaulted Jackson to national stardom and helped foil plans for a British invasion of the American frontier. And so if you caught the dates there, it was a, a, an idea that they signed a treaty, but the people in the battle never got word that the war had ended. And so here they are in the Battle of New Orleans, fighting, giving their lives, sacrificing in the middle of this battle in a war that had already ended. They were fighting under old marching orders, right? Because they had not yet received word that the battle and the war was actually over. And that's kind of what we see here with these apostles or these disciples that uh, Paul meets in Ephesus. They are living under old marching orders. They, they are familiar with the Old Testament and John the Baptist, but they aren't quite yet familiar with the new marching orders they are to be living by. They'd receive the baptism of repentance, but not the baptism of the Spirit that Paul is going to introduce them to. So in other words, they were living under a life of religion, but didn't understand the fullness of what a relationship with Jesus are all about. You ever met people like that who are engulfed with the religion, but don't fully understand what a relationship with Jesus is all about? I think we have many people in our cultural context here in New England that fall under this boat. They might associate themselves as a religious person, but they're like these disciples here. They don't understand what the spirit of God is like living inside of them. They don't understand what a relationship with Jesus is all about. And so they are kind of living in the same way that these disciples were living. 
You know, how many people do we meet that equate Christianity to a set of morals or laws or commands as opposed to equating Christianity with what it truly is, and that is a personal relationship with Jesus? You see, Paul comes to these disciples, and as he begins to talk to them, he realizes that something just doesn't add up. There's something that just doesn't mesh. As he observes their life and as he talks to them, they know about repentance and they know about the Old Testament, but there is no evidence of them being filled by the Spirit of God. And so we see that as Paul explains to them about Jesus and how John's teaching actually was pointing to Jesus, and he began to explain to them what the Holy Spirit is and who Jesus was, they, they understand and they believe. And it says in verse 6, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there were about 12 men in all. And so here we see what happens oftentimes in the book of Acts. We see this similar pattern taking place. People come to know Jesus. They come to believe the gospel and then there's the apostles there who are laying hands on them. And all of a sudden we see the spirit causing them to speak in tongues and those kind of things. We saw it back in Acts chapter 2 when the spirit fell on the apostles. We saw it in Acts chapter 8 where the Samaritans come to Jesus and they begin speaking in tongues. We saw it in Acts 10 when the Gentiles come to Christ and they begin speaking in tongues. And so what God is doing here is he is giving credibility to what is taking place. And as each new group of people comes to uh, associate with Jesus and who he is and his teaching and his message, they all of a sudden begin speaking in tongues. Now, understand, that does not mean that speaking in tongues is a qualification for us today. You don't need to look at your life and say, well, I've never spoken in tongues, so I must not be saved. That is not what I'm trying to say, because I, for one, fall in that boat, never spoken in tongues, all right? Obviously not against it, just never, not an experience I've ever experienced, but I know that I'm saved. So what we need to understand is that what's taking place in the book of Acts does not mean it is norm for everything. This is a book of transition. And as God is transitioning things from Judaism to Christianity and all these things are taking place, one of the ways he is giving evidence to what he is doing is these amazing miracles such as believers speaking in tongues. So again, this does not mean that it is a requirement for our salvation today. However, we do know that the Holy Spirit is a requirement for our salvation today. So you don't have to speak in tongues, but you do need to be filled with the Spirit of God. That is a true evidence of a person that is a child of God. Let me give you some verses. Later on, Paul would write a letter to this church in Ephesus, and he would say this in chapter 1. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Romans 8 says this, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption of sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children with God. And then let's look at one more. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So one of the surefire ways to know if you truly are a child of God is to ask yourself the question, does the spirit of God reside inside of me? If the answer to that question is yes, then you are a child of God, because God never places a spirit in a person who doesn't first believe in him, who does not have a relationship with him. You cannot get the spirit of God without first through faith uh, having a relationship with Jesus. And that's what we see here. That's why Paul says, he doesn't say, have you gone to church? He doesn't say, have you been baptized even? He doesn't say, have you done all these religious things? What does he say to them? Have you received the spirit? And what do they say? Well, we didn't even know there was a spirit. Tell us more about this spirit that you're talking about. And so that's exactly what Paul does. And as he confirms with them the gospel and they come to believe, then instantly they are filled with the spirit. So after those in the synagogue, and then Paul goes on and says in verse 8, he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some stubborn and 
when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. All right, so we see that Paul is then taking a message from the synagogues because they aren't receiving it. And he's going to just rent space in this hall of Tyrannus, and he's going to just daily teach the word of God to the people here. But what we need to see in this first event about this meaningful baptism is they had been baptized once already, right? They didn't baptize with the baptism of John, but it was really insignificant. They were living under old marching orders. They were misled on what the reality of the truth was. They, they only had part of the story. And so as Paul arrives and asks them, hey, have you received the spirit? And begins to talk to them about Jesus and how he came to fulfill what John had been talking about. Now they have the whole story and now they can enter a relationship with Jesus, fully understanding through faith that Jesus was the Messiah that John was speaking of. So understand, one of the surefire ways to know if you are a child of God is to ask yourself the question, does the Holy Spirit reside in me? If the answer is yes, then you know I'm a child of God. If the answer is no, then we need to do some self-examination because what we might have is religion like these people had, but not a true relationship with Jesus. Are you tracking with me? Does that make sense, what's taking place here? So I think with the first event we see here in this meaningful baptism is that the Spirit of God is the key when it comes to our salvation. Then we get to verse 11. The second event we see is this massive beatdown that takes place. And I tried to alliterate all these for you. So a meaningful baptism, a massive beatdown and things like that. But in this event, we're also going to see an element of salvation that is necessary. It says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, let me pause there for a second. Extraordinary miracles. So that means these are miracles that you don't usually see on a regular basis, right? These are miracles that if you're not doing these in your life, it's okay, okay? If you're not performing these miracles, you don't have to question your spirituality. You don't quite have to question your salvation, any of those things. These are unique to this event. What is he doing? It says that even handkerchiefs or aprons that Paul had touched on his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and evil spirits came out of them. Isn't that an amazing thing? Here, Paul's working as a tent maker. He's sweating. He's using his sweat cloths. People are taking those sweat cloths, going and putting them on the sick, and all of a sudden, they're being healed. Okay? This is an extraordinary thing that is taking place, but God is using it again to confirm the message that Paul is preaching. The fact that they were extraordinary means that we shouldn't expect this to be the norm. So when you turn on Christian TV and they're asking you to send money and they're going to send you this prayer cloth and it's going to heal all your diseases, take second thought about what is happening here, all right? This is not the norm. This is not something that should be happening all the time. These are extraordinary things. Now, does God still do miracles? Absolutely. But the things we see happening here, we shouldn't like get upset because we can't do these in our own life, all right? So because you sweat and wipe it on a rag and take it and touch somebody and they don't be, aren't healed, don't kind of discredit your own spirituality, all right? That, that's kind of what's going on here. In fact, I love what John MacArthur says here. He says, Acts is a book of transition. You can't, cannot take the experience of Acts and make them the norm, all right? God is working here, but we need to not, you know, kind of, I expect everything to still be happening just as we saw it here in the book of Acts. So we then come to these uh, sons of Sceva. It says in verse 13, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus the, over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jews whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of the Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them. So they fled out of the household naked and wounded. So we have this man, Sceva, who was a Jewish priest. And after seeing Paul's success in casting out demons and performing exorcisms, his sons thought that 
they could do the same thing by using the name of Jesus and by, you know, proclaiming about the one that Paul teaches. And so they'd come up with this cute little incantation that they would walk around and try to cast out demons by saying this little phrase. Well, they get to this demon and they try to cast out this demon and the demon looks at them and says, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I acknowledge, and, but who in the world are you? They didn't understand the authority of these men because they had no authority. It was Jesus and the power of the Spirit of God that had the authority over these demons. They had no power. These men were religious charlatans. They were pretenders. There was no power in their crafty incantations. And so we need to be careful that we don't take everything to heart just because so-called religious leader may say it. An important lesson here is that God's power and spirit don't enter our lives merely through saying certain words. Did you know salvation is much deeper than just a prayer that you said as a little kid? Now, I'm not downplaying a prayer that you said as a little kid. But if that is the only basis you have as your salvation, well, when I was younger, I said a prayer. And that's the only proof you have hanging on that I would really intensively, intensely look at your salvation because it's a lot more than just some words that you say. Again, I'm not downplaying. As a child asking Christ to save you, I did that. And I know it was sincere and genuine. But I meet so many people who, you know, you talk to them about spiritual things, and all they can go back to is a time they said a prayer when they were in Sunday school. They don't understand the Holy Spirit in their work in their life currently. They've never opened up their Bible sense. There's, there's no proof of any growth that's taken place in their life. And all they have to hang on to is this words that were said, this prayer that was said. Here we have these men who are saying spiritual words, but there's no power backing those words. And so we need to understand what is being said here. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. You see, salvation is about more than just saying a prayer. It's a gift from God that comes by faith. Now, if you said the prayer in faith, and then the Holy Spirit began to indwell your life, that's a whole different ballgame. But if you just said a prayer in some emotional event, and that's all you have to hang on to, you need to be careful because salvation is not just about saying some magic words. Then we get to verse 18. And don't you love that, that beatdown that takes place here? It says, they overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now, I've watched a lot of UFC fights and a lot of boxing matches over the years, and I have never seen anybody get beat down to this point, right? Like, that is a major beatdown that's getting taken place here. This one person overcomes these seven, and they leave just fleeing naked and wounded. I just, this is one of those scenes you would have loved to be there for, as the power of God overcomes this power of darkness. Verse 18, also many of those who are now believers came confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So the third event we see is not only this uh, meaningful baptism and this massive beatdown, but the last thing we see in this passage is a monstrous bonfire that takes place here in the city of Ephesus. Now, how many of you like a good bonfire? Anybody? Yeah, I love this time of year as the fall is here and as it's getting colder, our family loves to kind of just sit out by the fire and, you know, roast marshmallows and things like that. It's, it, there's just nothing like it this time of year. But here we have this major bonfire that happens. It's, the Spirit of God, you know, begins to bring revival to the city of Ephesus. They look at what has just happened, you know, as these seven sons of Sceva are beat down in just this amazing way, and God's power is obviously being poured out. We see that so many who uh, are now believers come confessing and divulging their practices. They come with just a spirit of, hey, I have this area in my life, and I need to fix it. 
All right, so we need to understand that revival is breaking out here in the city of Ephesus because people are recognizing their sinfulness. They're repenting of their sins. And as part of their repentance, they are bringing those things that are a part of their old life, their books of magic and all the things that were associated with their idolatry. And they're bringing it and they're throwing it in a fire and having it be burned up. It reminds me, how many of you, anybody get the privilege when they were a kid of going to church camp? Anybody? Okay, a lot of church camps, you'll have the fire at the end of the week, right? This big bonfire. And and during that time, people give testimony about what God is doing. That's kind of what I picture taking place here in the city of Ephesus. Everybody's gathered around. There's this huge bonfire. And people are just going up to the fire, just throwing in all their, you know, old books and all their things that they know are associated with their idolatry because they are making a clean break from the old life that they were once living. So what does this teach us about true salvation? Well, it teaches us that true salvation is going to bring about transformation in our lives. And that's another evidence of salvation, right? Because as the spirit of God takes root in your life, one of the things that is not going to happen or that should not happen is that you should not stay the same. When the Spirit of God enters your life, one of the first things that's going to happen is he's going to begin to change you from the inside out. That's why there's a passage in Galatians that talks about the fruits of the Spirit. Things like love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and self-control. Things that without the Spirit of God, we are very bad at, would you agree? But the Spirit of God moves in. And he begins to go to work in our hearts. And he begins to chip away at those old behaviors. And he begins to conform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So we need to be like these people here in Ephesus who are willing to constantly repent and turn from our sins. Repentance should not be a a term that we are unfamiliar with as followers of Jesus. Because if you're anything like me, I have to repent on a regular basis. God... Here I am following this path of sin again. God, here I am. This is coming to my life. Help me. I repent of it. I want to do the right thing. Because when the Spirit of God begins to indwell our lives, I guarantee he will not keep us the same. He will go to work trying to conform us into the image of Jesus. And so that's what's taking place here. These people, because they've come to know Christ and the spirit has begun to move into their lives, they recognize their sinfulness. They recognize all the things that uh, were a part of their life that, you know, associated them with idolatry. And they throw those things in the fire saying, we are not going back to that way of life. We are now following Jesus. And so we see the event that Paul records or that Luke records is this monster's bonfire. But it teaches us about true salvation And it teaches us that true salvation will always include a life being transformed. Does that make sense? So let me kind of put a bow on this. Again, as I watch sporting events and I hear different people talk about God or Christianity, these things, I can never know their hearts. I don't know by the spiritual statements they make whether they're truly saved or not. But at the end of the day, it's not for me to be concerned about. My main concerns need to be the salvation of my own soul. And today we've seen very clearly here in this passage some sure-tale signs of a person that is truly saved. You see, this passage has taught us that true salvation comes by faith in the finished work of Jesus. It's not about just repeating some prayer. It's not about just conforming to some set of standards. It's about faith and the finished work of Jesus. And the minute we come to God in faith, recognizing our own sinfulness, admitting our need for a savior, the Holy Spirit moves into our lives and he begins to go to work. God gives us the greatest gift we could ever be given and that is his spirit living inside of us. Aren't you glad that you don't have to navigate the Christian life on your own? Aren't you glad that God gives you his spirit that will guide you and direct you along the path that God wants you to go. You see, the moment salvation occurs, you are given that great gift of God's spirit. And so how do I know if I'm saved? Well, ask yourself these questions. Is there clear evidence that the Holy Spirit resides in me? 
Are you experiencing conviction when you step out of line? Do you sense the Holy Spirit kind of nudging you to, hey, this is wrong, you shouldn't have done that? You see, but he doesn't do that to condemn you. He does that to bring you into alignment with God. And so conviction, can you look at your life and recognize growth taking place? Now, for some of us, it happens slowly, all right? For me, it happens very slowly. But can you look at your life and say, okay, I'm not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I once was. You see, if you are growing and there's evidence of change taking place, then it's a good sign the Spirit of God is working in you. So is there conviction? Is there growth? Do you have a hatred for sin, a love for God's word, all those kind of things? Is there evidence of transformation taking place in your life? So again, if you're not sure of the answer to that question about the Spirit of God residing in you, I have really good news today, and that is this. Today can be your day of salvation. That's what the Bible says. Today can be the day of salvation for you. See, all you have to do is recognize, like these believers in Ephesus, that we are born sinful, separated from God. But because of his great love, he made a way for our sin to be forgiven. That way is through the person of his son, Jesus Christ, that died on the cross for your sins and mine. And if we will acknowledge in faith what Jesus Christ did on the cross, the Bible makes it clear that we can be in a relationship with God. What was once separated from God can now be brought into alignment because of what Jesus Christ did. He'll give us the gift of the Holy Spirit, and he will then begin to transform our lives and mold us more and more into the image of Jesus. So today can be the day that you get those things settled. So my encouragement for those of you today who aren't sure about that is what's holding you back? So often the enemy tries to convince us of all these different things. We try to tries to get us to buy all these different lies, but the truth of the matter is this. Those that have the spirit have life Those that do not have the spirit do not have life. And he's talking about eternal life when he says that. So if you want the spirit of God to reside in you, it comes by faith in the finished work of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So if nothing else, I know many of us have that relationship with God. This is a good reminder about what the spirit desires to do in our lives. He desires to transform us, desires to mold us and shape us, He desires for us to live a life of constant repentance where we're recognizing sin that creeps in and we're willing to repent of it, get it right, so that we can live in a right relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense this morning? So again, thank you for bearing with my voice. I wanted to get a lot more animated, but I knew I couldn't do it. But I hope the truth of God's word did not fall on deaf ears today and instead you can take what God said in his word you can apply it to your life and if nothing else if you know the spirit does not live inside of you don't walk out this building today without getting that settled because you could have said a prayer as a kid you could have grown up in church you could have done all these things but religion will not save you only a relationship with God because of what Jesus Christ did brings true salvation So if you're hanging your hat on anything else, you are being misled by the enemy. And he has you right where you want you, close, but yet still so far away. And there's a day coming when you'll stand before God and he'll separate the sheep from the goats. And I pray that you won't be in the group that's with the goats thinking you're saved, but not truly knowing it. So Father, thank you for the truth of your word. God, I thank you for uh, the fact that your word speaks truth to our lives. And God, I thank you for each person who's here today and those listening online. Father, who have borne with the fact that I can hardly speak, but Lord, I pray that the truth of your word still came across and will still resonate in each of our hearts. Lord, I pray for the one or the two or maybe more who are here today or who are watching online who can't honestly answer yes to the question of does the Holy Spirit live inside of you? And so God, I pray for those individuals 
God, that today in these next few moments as we sing this final song, that they will just, Father God, sense your nudging in their soul. They will sense your spirit tugging at them, telling them that they need Jesus. And I pray that they'll have the courage and the boldness to respond. Lord, for those of us who have been walking with you for a while, God, I pray that this message will be a good reminder about what the Spirit of God wants to do in our lives, how he wants to transform us, how he wants us to live with just this constant repentant uh, spirit about us. Where we're recognizing sin so that we can grow and grow and grow and become all that you want us to be. Father, Paul had, ama- God, Paul had an amazing ministry, not because he was some spectacular speaker, but because he was yielded to the Spirit of God and because God was working through his life. And Lord, I know you want to use each and every one of us in this room as well, but what it takes is for us to yield to your spirit. So God, help us to have people in this building who are yielded to you, who have surrendered to you, who are allowing your spirit to flow through us so that you can minister through us to those around us that you place in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you're here with us today, we invite you to stand and sing this song with us. If you're online and you need Jesus today, you need to be filled with the spirit of God that we talked about. We encourage you to text the word surrender to the number on the screen. If you're here and you need that, don't leave without talking to me or talking to somebody else about what it takes for you to begin that relationship with Jesus. So let this be a song of response where you respond to what God is doing on your heart.